Spanning the length of Australia, from Adelaide to Darwin, the Stewart Highway is 2,834 kilometres long and cuts the continent in half, an isolated and often lonely road. It was here, in 2001, that two English backpackers travelling in their VW Combi van met their fate and sparked the biggest manhunt in Northern Territory history. There was this incredible story hijacked in the middle of Australia and her boyfriend was missing. It's hard to imagine anywhere that's uh, more isolated uh, than, than the outback. The person involved in this incident is, is armed and dangerous. I couldn't imagine a more frightening and intimidating experience. That magic combination of the British tourist, the human interest, the murder, the mystery. There was evidence that was a lot of blood there. If I could say one thing to this man, I would ask him to let the police know where Pete is. She's the only one that can actually tell anyone exactly what happened that night. You can't make up DNA profiles. It's either there or it's not there. This is the first time I've been exposed to that type of voracious, shark-feeding frenzy of the media. Everyone had a theory. The question I have is, where is Peter Falconio? We really still don't know what happened. We really still don't know. The incredible story of Peter Falconio and Joanne Lees was a crime that shook Australia. In 2001, English backpackers Joanne Lees and boyfriend Peter Falconio arrived in Australia, halfway through a world trip. They purchased a combi van in Sydney and embarked on an adventure through southeast and central Australia. The couple arrived in Alice Springs, the central heart of Australia, on Thursday the 12th of July. Alice Springs was quite a different place then. Uh, we didn't really have a crime problem. It was very much a community policing type of style where it was high engagement with people and a great place to live and work. I really enjoyed it. It's never boring. You know, to me, the world comes to Alice. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to go to the world, you know. Peter Falconio called his parents in the UK on Friday the 13th of July. The young couple were in good spirits and excited about their travels. The next day, Peter and Joanne headed north on the Stewart Highway towards Darwin. Joanne and Peter, as we understand it, left Alice Springs around four o'clock in the afternoon to head north. They stopped at a place called Tea Tree on the way to get some petrol. After watching the sunset at Tea Tree Roadhouse, 194 kilometres north of Alice Springs, the couple drove another 100 kilometres towards Darwin passing Barrow Creek Roadhouse. They continued on a little bit longer and Joanne noticed a few fires by the side of the road, not knowing what these were. Peter wanted to stop and put them out. He thought they were a bit dangerous to keep going, but Joanne, feeling a little bit uncomfortable, she said, no, Pete, let's keep driving. Let's keep driving. They had been smoking a joint prior to that at Tea Tree, um, so they might have been a little bit clouded. They may have been you know, quite sort of dreamy and relaxed and a bit tired, maybe. My first surprise was that they were still driving um, and had bypassed, well, one tea tree to uh, Barrow Creek uh, because it had turned dark and, you know, the signs everywhere in those days were just all about staying off the road at night. You couldn't pick a more remote area of Australia in that time of year, very cold too. It's very isolated, very little hope of any type of rescue if you get stuck unless there is passing traffic and there's very little of that. Unless you've got a big moon, it's literally just pitch black. Um, you see nothing, only from what your headlights can throw. Peter noticed some headlights behind them in the combi and expressed some frustration that the person behind them wasn't trying to overtake, irrespective of how much they slowed the combi down. Eventually, that four-wheel drive pulled out from behind them, travelled along next to them, and the driver indicated that there was a problem with the back of their camper van. To have someone drive up beside you in the middle of the Australian outback uh, in, his, in, his, in his ute and gesticulate to you uh, 
would have been a bit alarming to most people. Just after 8 p.m., 11 kilometers past Barrow Creek Roadhouse, the couple pulled their combi van over to the side of the Stewart Highway. The man pulled up behind them as well. Peter got out and Joanne heard a conversation to the effect was that there was some sparks coming out of the exhaust pipe. Peter moved back to the front of the combi van, said to Joanne, get into the driver's seat and rev the engine for me. Then Peter comes back and picks up his cigarettes and then appears to be quite relaxed, doesn't appear to be threatened in any way, uh, then returns to the rear of the camper van and the discussion continues. Joanne revved the engine and heard what she thought was the combi van backfiring, as it had done in the past. In the middle of the outback, in absolute darkness and unfamiliar with the surroundings, the young couple had hoped this stranger would help them during their Australian adventure. Next thing she knows, a gun pointed at her, and there's a man looking at her through the window. He then tells Joanne to move over to the passenger seat, and then he proceeds to tie her up. Stunned and terrified, Joanne's hands were tied behind her back with manacles made from cable ties and tape. She was in a pretty frightened and, and, and terrorised state. Uh, uh, she was clearly traumatised by what was going on. Pushed her out of the van. She didn't know where Pete was. He didn't have the opportunity to restrain her ankles. She was kicking around too much. He pulled her up, made her stand up, and then guided her past the camper van towards his own vehicle. She never saw Peter's body. She never saw a body at all. And then somehow he manhandled her into the back of the four-wheel drive. Screaming and struggling, Joanne Lees lay in the attacker's vehicle, calling desperately for her boyfriend, Peter Falconio. While she was in the back of the four-wheel drive, she heard some dragging noises, didn't know what they were. She knew that she was probably going to get killed. She was more worried about what would happen uh, before that happened. Fearful for her life, Joanne Lees made an impulsive and shrewd decision that altered the course of her fate. She was in fear of her life, and that's what got her out of the back of the truck and running into the bush. She had nothing else to lose. When you're running into the bush there, you, you barely see, you know, the bushes in front of you until they're kind of upon you. The headlights at the time were the only thing that illuminated the scene when Joanne was running for her life through the bushes. It was like a blanket had been put over the world. I couldn't imagine a more frightening and intimidating experience knowing that there's really no one to come to your assistance. In 2001, whilst travelling along an isolated stretch of the Stewart Highway in Central Australia, 28-year-old Peter Falconio and his girlfriend Joanne Lees were flagged down by a man in a white four-wheel drive truck. When they pulled over to the side of the road, Peter got out to talk to the man. That moment would be the last time anyone ever saw Peter Falconio alive again. Just after 8.30 p.m., in remote and vast bushland, Joanne Lees crouched beneath a bush hidden in the darkness. Having escaped from the man who had attacked her, she remained motionless as he searched for her with his dog. He was unable to find her once she you know, shot off into the bush and then took a, took a turn and ran 30 metres in another direction, so uh, that saved her life, I've no doubt about that. He looked for her with a torch, the dog never seemed to find her as well. In fact, the dog just ignored her most of the time, as far as she can recall. She slid under a, under a low piece of scrub and just waited there until he left. People in Britain and in other well-populated countries can't imagine how vast the outback is and how lonely you would be if you were suddenly or left to your own devices there, particularly if you thought you were being threatened by you know, an attacker. It would be probably the most um, intimidating and scary situations to be in. Hidden from her attacker and unsure of his whereabouts, Joanne struggled to remove the manacles she was tied with. 
she heard some movement of vehicles, assumed that he'd taken the combi away. Then she heard footsteps again and the torchlight once more, and then he drove off in his four-wheel drive. She was hiding in that um, shrub for five or six hours in, in cold winter temperatures. It, it would have been a very lonely and, and traumatic experience for her. And it wasn't until many hours later that she actually ran out onto the road, risking her life in front of a huge road train trailer that drives along the highway. And that's when Vince Miller stopped and picked her up. 60 metres long, lights all over it, you know, 40 or 50 wheels on the thing making a massive noise, but she had no choice but to try and stop this thing in the middle of the night. That's how desperate she was. Uh, and then to trust that person to take her to safety. Unable to stop suddenly, driver Vince Miller feared he had run over the young woman. Stopping the large truck almost a kilometre down the highway, Vince discovered a distressed and injured Lees, who told him and his co-driver of her ordeal. They embarked on a search for Peter, but stopped soon after Vince learned that the attacker was armed and still at large. They immediately drove Joanne 11 kilometers south to Burrow Creek Roadhouse. An iconic old outback pub, um, rough as guts, um, you know, seemingly full of rough characters and whatever, but really with hearts of gold, you know, salt of the earth people. Barrow Creek proprietor Les Pilton and his partner Helen Jones looked after Joanne and called the police immediately. Les would have stopped everything. He would have just worked his guts out to try and sort that situation out. I got a phone call being kind of one of the more senior police there to say that they'd received a report of a, um, a young woman being abducted and her boyfriend being murdered. So um, I immediately went to work, I think three or four in the morning. A huge manhunt is underway in the Northern Territory where a gunman is believed to have kidnapped a British tourist and terrorised his girlfriend. We consider the person involved in this incident is, is armed and dangerous. Within 24 hours, over 100 police, volunteers and aircraft had been deployed in the search for the gunman. The police set up some roadblocks and there was a huge manhunt going on and amazing detours around the area were being put in place. The roadblocks really didn't get enacted until the Sunday morning. So you're talking 12, 16 hours from when it actually happened. North to Darwin, south to Alice Springs and even south to South Australia as well. And uh, uh, so, the, so if you were going to escape, you'd have had a hard time avoiding the police. Like, well, he's long gone, unless he's local. They should have got Aboriginal trackers involved right from day one. The ability of those people is just astonishing. They'll track somebody through vast areas of grass, yet here are some of the best trackers in the entire world, and they weren't really utilised until later, or too late, I think, yeah. The police released a composite image of the gunman and his truck, as described by Joanne Lees, in the hope the public would assist in the identification of her attacker. You just described half of the Territory male population. <laughs> but as far as that, that type of land cruiser in Alice Springs went, oh, well, they were a dime a dozen. As police searched for the gunman in the hope of finding Peter alive, blood was discovered at the scene, and forensic biologist Carmen Eckhoff was called in to the investigation. Very quickly, obvious to me that there was an area that had considerable blood. There was more blood than what you could see visibly. And then as you, you know, you could push away some of the top dirt to then expose some of the blood underneath. So yeah, and you could see actually where it's been flicked up to try and cover up the scene. They'd found the camper van uh, a little further up the highway, uh, parked off the side of the road in deep bush, uh, some distance from where Joanne had been hiding. I was asked to examine the combi van, obviously, we were looking for blood. Um, we also look, took out some other um, items, took a sample of the steering wheel and the gear shift. And the reason being is whoever drove the car must have had to have held it to get it over the rough terrain. Basically, we use a technique of tape lifting where we take just ordinary um, sticky tape and essentially go around the steering wheel 
collecting um, cellular material. The sample was then put into a sterilised container and it came back with me when I went back to the lab uh, in Darwin for analysis. Four days after the attack, Peter Falconio's father and brother arrived from the UK. Taken to the site at Barrow Creek, they made a public appeal for any information. As media interest intensified, Joanne Lees remained elusive and everyone was keen to see and hear from the woman at the centre of the incident. Media, from not just Australian media, but from all over the world, sort of gravitated towards Alice Springs. So every time you drive your car in and out, you were kind of fighting between vans of cameras and it, it consumed the town. It was huge. Joanne was reluctant to talk about what had happened. She was reluctant to go into any detail about uh, the actual incident. And, and, and reporters generally want as much information as possible for their story. Despite the police efforts to try to persuade her to open up and, and to talk to the media, she kept her lips tightly sealed. That was probably the main difficulty in terms of trying to formulate a story. Now, a lot of people just don't know how to handle uh, sudden media attention. Amid the unprecedented media frenzy and search for word from Joanne Lees, local journalist Mark Wilton received a phone call from Helen Jones, a friend from Barrow Creek Roadhouse who was looking after Joanne. It was very early on uh, Monday morning that um, Joanne was with her. She explained to me that Joanne had read the papers, had seen what was in the papers. She wasn't happy with some of the inaccuracies in the story. Uh, that she'd read so far. The other papers turned up later in the day and they got worse. Joanne was actually quite upset about them. The information wasn't coming out from the police as much as we would like to have received it. And certainly we were getting no news out of Joanne. Um, in terms of that, yes, of course, news agencies start to uh, create conjecture as to perhaps what the stories were. As hundreds of media descended on the small town in pursuit of a story or glimpse of Joanne, Mark Wilton was invited to an interview to clarify issues Joanne had with media reports. She wouldn't answer anything to do with the actual um, incident, as it were, because she'd been asked not to. Police didn't even know she was doing the interview, mind you, but she, you know, she said, I don't really feel as though I should. Um, and a lot of that, she did say, was out of respect for Pete's family. She said she'd never at any stage said she heard a gunshot. What she thought was a gunshot, she thought it was the combi backfiring. I just want to set the record straight on a few things. I found exactly what I thought, somebody who'd been through something quite traumatic. 11 days after the attack, Joanne Lees finally agreed to face the media. Accompanied by Peter's brother, Paul Falconio, Joanne made a brief prepared statement. If I could say one thing to this man who did this, I would ask him to let the police know where Pete is. It wasn't going to be any ordinary media conference. She wanted to um, stage it on her, on her terms. Uh, her terms were, I want a list of questions beforehand. She wasn't going to talk to the media en masse. It was not going to be a press conference as we kind of thought it would be. She was given a list of questions by the police and she crossed 10 of them off. I don't want to talk about this, I don't want to talk about this, I don't want to talk about that. Anyone that's spoken to me or has been in contact, you know, in contact with me, no one doubts me. And the comments that she made in that press conference kind of stung a little bit because and we'd only been in this story for 11 days so far, but she'd already created this rift between, I guess, what the international media and the local media were looking for and what her perspective on it was. It didn't really change anything. It sort of opened up more questions than anything else. Joanne's conduct had become cause for concern and frustration and public speculation about her inaccuracies in evidence would cause further tension and doubt. There have been suspicions about her story. In an attempt to put the rumours to rest, Territory Police, for the first time, produced photos of the injuries she received that night. Although there was evidence at the scene, there wasn't a whole lot of it. So there was still too many questions to answer. And of course, the police have to discount the people who are so close to the victim to start off with, to make sure, to rule them out. But I don't think they necessarily ruled her out entirely, as far as the media were concerned. People expect victims to act in a particular way, and when they don't do that, they then uh, create a bit of mistrust around them. So I think that's what happened with Joanne. She knew that there was people who were investigating the matter that just didn't believe her. 
I knew that the English press were tough, uh, but it wasn't until I received that note back from just one news editor out of the many that I was dealing with that said, we reckon she did it. And then I thought, hang on a sec, there's another story going on here. In 2001, Joanne Lees was abducted at gunpoint on a remote stretch of highway in central Australia. She was kidnapped by an unknown assailant and her boyfriend Peter was missing. Joanne managed to escape into bushland, where she hid for hours before flagging down a passing road train that took her to safety. Despite pleas from the police, Joanne remained hidden from the media until she finally faced the cameras. After Joanne's press conference, wild and unsubstantiated accusations circulated, forcing her further into retreat. Northern Territory Police were overwhelmed with the influx of media, whose pursuit for information was unrelenting. When news of CCTV footage surfaced... There'd been a rumour, a suggestion, that the gunman or the attacker had been caught uh, on CCTV footage at an Alice Springs service station. But no CCTV footage had emerged. I think it was 19 days, I think, roughly after the incident, when we knew about the video. Where had that footage gone to? Why had the police not used it to find the attacker and uh, publish those pictures on the TV and the internet and, uh, and the newspaper? The story was that they sent it away to get enhanced. You know, you've got to realise that this footage at the time had what they believed was you know, the truck that he was driving, and they didn't even put that out. You know, it was critical that we tried to get the, the registration number of the vehicle. Um, and we tried everything, the most sophisticated technology, to be able to do that. You could have identified the car off the CCTV. I don't think anyone would doubt that it could have been handled a whole lot better. I think, in, also in defence of the team, we were consumed with thousands of lines of inquiry. Where we went wrong is how we prioritised what was important and what wasn't. Five months into the investigation, amid a task force shake-up, and mounting frustration with media pressure and police procedure, a new lead detective was appointed. I got a phone call from Paul White, who was the just taken over as the new commissioner, and said, congratulations, you're now taking over the Falconio investigation. I put the phone down, and I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, in all honesty, because it didn't seem to be particularly well organised. In 2001, Colleen Gwynne was the regional superintendent for the central region in Alice Springs. I observed for probably about a week and it was clear to me that we had a task force that wasn't gelling very well. There was people there that I don't think were there for the right reasons and there was a number of people that didn't actually believe the victim. So when you're investigating a major crime such as this, you have to believe the victim. Otherwise you will get careless and you'll miss things. So the first thing I did was get some detectives on aeroplanes and go and follow up what I saw was the, the priority inquiries. And I think that's probably one of the best decisions I ever made. Months after her traumatic experience, Joanne Lees returned to the UK, disillusioned with the police and wary of the media. Oh, she was, she was angry. She was frustrated. Um, she, she, wasn't, she didn't trust us. She didn't believe that we had the ability to be able to um, investigate this matter. Yeah, look, there were, we got a lot of things wrong. We spent some time with her. We were able to clarify some of the areas that were perhaps a little bit confusing. It then also reinforced my view that we had someone who was a remarkable witness. It was just incredible that her recollection and her ability to articulate things that happened in the most traumatic event that anyone could ever go through. Task Force members whittled down the number of suspects from 3,000 to 26 men. They had assembled a DNA profile and possible identity of a suspect they were particularly interested in locating. We had a DNA profile from an unknown male and that residual was very similar um, to the DNA profile that we found on the back of the T-shirt that belonged to Joanne. With the discovery of a DNA profile, the task force were hopeful to compare results with national and international databases. Disappointingly, there was no match. That was a beautiful profile, 
Uh, we got a full DNA uh, picture from it. That unknown profile that we found on the T-shirt is also present on the gear stick and on the steering wheel, which just gives a bit more weight to the police saying, well, if they find this person, then they know they can ask the questions and interrogate them to say, well, you know, we also know that you were in the vehicle. Uh, how come your DNA is in the vehicle? Carmen Eckhoff was our forensic expert here and did an outstanding job. I think Carmen um, was such a critical part of our case. The forensic area um, was, was critical. So they were there side by side with us for a lot of time during the preparation of our case. Forensics meticulously tested the manacles with which the attacker had tied Joanne's wrists. The manacles were a homemade attempt of making handcuffs made with cable ties and uh, black tape. Even though she was handcuffed at the back, she managed to skimmy out of them and everybody was very disbelieving of it. But she was able to do it because they'd put that extra link in the manacle. Um, there was a lot of uh, strawberry lip gloss on the manacles, which Joanne had with her and was using to try and grease up to try and get out of it. It sort of masks any fingerprints that you may have found on the manacles when he um, tightened them. We had to find ways of getting tape to lift without damaging any DNA that could be underneath. Mostly it was Joanne's uh, DNA on the outer surfaces, but further underneath the tape, um, we did find um, traces of DNA from an unknown person. With the discovery of DNA in the manacles, the forensics team sought out the expertise of Dr Jonathan Whitaker, an English DNA scientist who specialised in low copy number, a sensitive DNA profiling technique that amplifies the levels of DNA from small amounts of starting material. I actually sent him a uh, the results I'd received when we attempted it in our lab and um, asked him if, you know, he would think that that was good enough quality to report on. And it was decided that I should take the centre loop manacle that we hadn't actually examined at all. Um, and I was to take that over to um, Jonathan and his team for him to do um, the low copy number. The results were essentially the same. Theirs was, um, their results were uh, a little more clearer, if you like, but because their technique had been peer reviewed, uh, it meant that uh, the results could be accepted by the courts. The DNA evidence was pivotal and police were keen to find one suspect from early in the investigation and verify his DNA. Finding him, however, would prove a difficult and onerous task. Bradley Murdoch was one of the early suspects in the hunt for the outback gunman. He was interviewed by police in Broome who accepted his alibi. It was clear that his behaviour and what he'd done following the events of the 14th of July um, were uh, odd and he changed his appearance, he changed the appearance of his vehicle. He was acting like a man who was running away from something. We should have made him more of a priority, and if we did, we would have had him much sooner. Oh, Murdoch was known to the police uh, for different reasons. As it turned out, you know, the, he was painted as somebody who was definitely in, involved in the, in the drug game. 43-year-old Bradley Murdoch lived in Broome in northwestern Australia. He was known to police as a local drug runner and served time for reckless use of a firearm. Questioned in 2001, local police accepted his alibi. After he stressed, he couldn't have driven the 1,943 kilometres back to Broome within 24 hours after the alleged incident. That came up time and time again. He couldn't have done it. He couldn't have uh, committed the crime, gotten back to Alice Springs and then head down the Tanami and made it to Broome. We did a reenactment with a similar car similar weighted down, the same, um, pretty much followed it to a T and we made it within plenty of time. And that was a critical part. There was more than enough time for Bradley Murdoch to, to do what he did and then and arrive in Broome. 
As forensic and task force investigators closed in on Bradley Murdoch, he went to ground. You know, Murdoch was spending a lot of his time in South Australia in the Riverland, living on the guest house of a Swan Reach property that was owned by a man, a woman and a young child. He was uh, turning that guest house into a bit of a bunker, turning into a, a bolt hole that he could hide in. He was ready to go, he was on the run, he knew we were after him and he knew it was only a matter of days before we turned up and arrested him. So he had packed his vehicle up and he was going to hide. He was heading off to Western Australia, somewhere where he couldn't be found. So he, he was on the move. We got word that Murdoch had been arrested and was going to stand trial in Adelaide for rape, specifically the unlawful sexual intercourse with a 12-year-old girl and the rape of her mother. But it's his DNA that could also hold the key on the night Peter Falconio disappeared. I knew that they had a bloke for a long time they were very keen on being able to get hold of, but I do know that DNA was an issue for them. And their break came in South Australia, basically. So he was charged in South Australia and I met him while he was on remand in Yatla Prison. Uh, he wouldn't give us an interview at the time, but he did have a long conversation with us about his uh, involvement or non-involvement in our matter here in the Northern Territory. Quite an intimidating man. We didn't actually address the evidence. He spoke and he, he raised different components of our evidence. Obviously the truck stop video because it had been all over the news hundreds of times. So he wanted to let us know that, yeah, that, that was him, but it wasn't on the night that we we're referring to. We were left with a truly bizarre situation. We were allowed to name Bradley Murdoch within South Australia with regard to the rape case. We were not allowed to link him to being a suspect to the Falconio case. Because as the defence had said from the very start, their case was that this matter had been created, fabricated, that their client was being framed purely to get his DNA onto the public record so that it could be used in the Falconio case. There was no doubt in my mind that he was panicking underneath his um, kind of tough exterior where he was trying to intimidate me inside I imagine that he, he was there was absolute panic. After little physical evidence was found to support the rape and abduction charges Bradley Murdoch was acquitted after the jury's verdict was not unanimous. The judge turned to Murdoch in the dock of the court said Mr Murdoch you're free to go. As the sheriff's officer opened the door to the dock the Northern Territory Police that had been perched for two weeks flooded into the dock, trying to push the sheriff's officer away to grab Murdoch. We had to be in a position to um, execute an arrest warrant and get him up to the Territory, which we did the day that he was acquitted in South Australia. We were there um, and took him into custody. Grabbed him by the top of the head and shoved him, basically folded him, because he's such a tall man, into the back of this car while the media's filming it. The Territory coppers watch the car go off and say, see you in Darwin. After dramatic scenes inside the Adelaide courthouse, Bradley Murdoch was arrested and transported to Darwin to face charges over the murder of Peter Falconio. In 2001, after Peter Falconio went missing, police searched every corner of Australia looking for the man Joanne Lees had described as being responsible. After two years, police believed they had their man. 43-year-old Bradley Murdoch, a known drug runner, was arrested in South Australia and extradited to Darwin to face charges for the murder of Peter Falconio. But he was a large man. He was known colloquial as Big Brad amongst his uh, contemporaries and colleagues. So he was very imposing. Circumstantially, it read very, very badly for Murdoch. We had a great legal team, we, we, we had a great case and we knew that and we'd done our homework and we just, we knew we were presenting a, a matter that would be committed to trial, absolutely. Yesterday, Territory Police matched Murdoch's DNA with blood found on the t-shirt of Peter Falconio's girlfriend, Joanne Lees. In May 2004, two years and nine months after the attack, Joanne Lees arrived back in Australia to face Bradley Murdoch at the committal hearing. If there was any anxiety, it was probably around Joanne's welfare. She was back in the Northern Territory. It's a place that doesn't have a lot of great memories for her. Joanne was arriving in a 
police squad car, unmarked, driving at breakneck speed. So that didn't do her any favours whatsoever. Had she just come to the court, walked along the pavement in a normal manner, then everything would have been fine. She might have got a lot of attention, but certainly it wouldn't have attracted the negative publicity that she got as a result of the car. There was issues with the transportation of Joanne to and from the court and her safety and the attention and the, the perception that still she wasn't a, a credible witness. The committal was pretty brutal for her. I mean, the journalists were pretty cruel. With During the committal hearing, startling evidence emerged about an affair Joanne had in Sydney in 2001. Her reliability as a witness, police procedure and contaminated DNA evidence were all called into question. Despite the salacious revelations, after five weeks of hearings, Bradley Murdoch was ordered to stand trial. We had to then get our case together. Um, the work really started and it was, it was like our second phase. We got our man, now let's get him convicted. On the 17th of October 2005, the criminal trial began. Peter Falconio's family returned to Australia and Joanne Lees possessed a confidence not publicly seen before. When the court case came around, she was very much more professional in her presentation. She even strode up the front steps of the courthouse, acknowledged the media. Bradley John Murdoch maintained his innocence and entered a plea of not guilty. His legal team were confident leading into the trial. When Bradley Murdoch appeared in court, uh, he looked like a man who was pretty confident about being uh, found not guilty. I do know uh, that he intimidated a lot of the witnesses just with his mere presence. There was something like 80 witnesses called, more than 200 pieces of evidence. A surprise witness for the prosecution was James Heppy, a former associate, friend and housemate of Murdoch's. His evidence would prove controversial and elicit a vicious exchange between both men in court. He was a man that had a disgruntled relationship with Bradley John Murdoch, no doubt about that, and the jury were directed to take his evidence. He was trying to negotiate his way out of a long prison sentence. He said to the police, uh, if uh, you look after me, then I will help you convict Bradley Murdoch. My problem with Happy is that it, it's tainted evidence, no matter what you do with Happy. It's, uh, you know, he's, he's a former partner of Murdoch's. After volatile scenes inside the courtroom, the case continued, and British DNA scientist Dr Jonathan Whittaker took to the stand. The DNA evidence um, was certainly very well um, prepared, um, presented in court, um, and even the three judges made the comment that the DNA evidence is watertight and that um, Murdoch's team would not be able to have that DNA thrown out. There was a lot of doubt about the, the, the whole DNA business. There was a lot of doubt about the, the so-called low copy number DNA and whether or not it could be expanded and could be used as a match against Murdoch's DNA. Whether you believe or don't believe in low copy number, ultimately it's the whole case that goes before the court and is judged against. I'm a firm believer that you can't make up DNA profiles. It's either there or it's not there. Murdoch's defence lawyer, Grant Algie, questioned the contamination of DNA in the manacles, claiming poor police procedure and tampering of evidence. I think our biggest um, issue with DNA is contamination. I was asked to retest the, the homemade manacles um, and I think it came out in court that um, my director at the time, Dr Peter Thatcher, had his DNA um, turn up. The testing is so sensitive, it's really difficult to say exactly how it got there. I can't answer that, but I'm expected in court to then give an answer. So I was against retesting, um, but I was forced to do it. The DNA evidence and the eyewitness evidence of Joanne are the only two things that, yeah, that could put him. Everything else was totally circumstantial. What I think we've all lost sight of is the fact that even though we have DNA evidence, it's still up to the police to piece together the 
the whole case to present that for the courts, and then it's for the courts to decide. In the last days of the trial, the defendant, Bradley John Murdoch, took to the stand. He had to take the stand because some of the evidence against him had become so damning. And Rex Wilde, who is one of the most incredible prosecutors, stood up and said to Bradley John Murdoch, where did you bury Peter Falconio? That was his first question. And it took Bradley John Murdoch by surprise, to the point that he actually appeared somewhat insulted. Look, we knew that Bradley John Murdoch was, was a bad man. And I guess those lays began to peel off as the questioning continued. But there was really nothing that Bradley John Murdoch offered to the court in his testimony that discounted the fact that he was the man that committed this crime. After a nine-week trial that heard allegations of controversial and contaminated evidence, a witness who was unfaltering in her story and a defendant that staunchly denied guilt, the jury returned with a verdict. A Darwin jury found Bradley John Murdoch is the outback killer, declaring him guilty of the British tourist's murder. There was a unanimous guilty verdict from the jury, guilty after guilty after guilty. I think probably the jury uh, made the right decision um, in the circumstances. Uh, whether uh, it reflected the accuracy and the truth of the crime remains to be seen. Well, I wouldn't have convicted him on the evidence that was presented in the court. I was just happy that we could play our part and, and get a conviction and put Bradley Murdoch behind bars for 28 years. After the verdict, Joanne Lees and the Falconio family addressed the media outside the courthouse. I'm obviously delighted with the unanimous verdict given here today. The most important thing to my family now is to find Peter's body. Bradley John Murdoch was jailed for a non-parole period of 28 years, while Joanne Lees was pursued by continuous speculation as to the credibility of her story a story that has reportedly earned her over half a million dollars. Murdoch unsuccessfully appealed his conviction and is currently serving a life sentence in Darwin's Berrimer jail. He maintains his innocence as public speculation continues about the incident and the whereabouts of Peter Falconio. I've always felt that there is another chapter to be written in this story. Um, what really happened to Peter Falconio? Um, what was the motive? Who killed him? Was it really Bradley Murdoch? This is the case in Australia that never ends. And I don't think there will be any conclusion until perhaps the remains of Peter Falconio are found or someone with more information about the case comes forward. It's just a pity that um, someone lost their life here. And I guess with Joanne, you know, she lives with this every day. And the Falconios are still without their son who they don't know where he is. So you have to remember about the people um, that are part of this, and that's not us, but it's them. You know, until that body is found, we will not know one way or the other, categorically, what happened to Peter Falconio.